Thank you very much for those of you who have come. Thank you, Emily, May, Foren, and Emily's, uh, no, May's boyfriend. What's his name? Nam. Nam. OK, all of you. <laughs> All of you who helped organize this event, I am very pleased to be here. I can tell you before I begin my presentation that I probably use Google a minimum of 10 to 20 times a day. Whatever I don't know, I go to Google. If I don't know how to spell it, I start spelling it. Google is going to spell it for me right. But I have to be close to a computer because my iPhone I use for writing and sending messages, emails, or tweets, or whatever. But Google helps me with all the information. I, uh, I usually like to start my presentation with the following statement. My name is Eva Kaur. I am a survivor of Auschwitz, a survivor of medical experiments conducted by Dr. Mengele. And now that I'm 81 years old, I am trying to survive old age. <laughs> and I'm finding it a bigger challenge than I realized. I was born in a tiny village in 1934 in Transylvania, Romania. Um, being born in the 1930s or 40s, a Jewish child, my destiny was decided already because Hitler already was in power in 1933. Our village had 100 families, all Christian, except the Moses family was Jewish. And from the time that I was six years old, when the war started and the village was occupied by the Hungarians, persecution against Jews began immediately. And I learned that children can be very mean to one another, particularly if they are taught to do so and rewarded for it. By um, first grade, when we entered, we were called Jew dirty Jews. And the kids beat my twin sister and Miriam up. And when we uh, complained to the teacher, the teacher punished us. So we learned within the first few days in school that there was no help for us. When we went home, I expected my mother to march to school and straighten it all out. But even though she was a wonderful human being, she hugged us, kissed us, and cried with us, but said, children, I am very sorry. There is nothing I can do. You have to learn that we are Jews, and you have to learn to take it. My father's attitude was a little bit different. He told us since we were going to school to be the best students in that one-room schoolhouse, and we were. When we got home, he said we needed to help with the work around that big, big farm. And at night, he said, you say your prayers. And he was very strict about that because we were Orthodox Jews. And he said, God is going to help us, and everything will be OK, and do not worry. And of course, I believed it. But as time went on, things changed. Every six months or so, new rules, new laws were passed against us. And in 1942, when I was eight years old, the, that new law that year was that Jews could not hire anybody but Jewish people, and in an all Christian village, that was not possible. My mother got sick. We tried to help the four girls, but we couldn't handle all the work on an old-fashioned farm. My father asked for a permit to travel to the big city to try to hire a Jewish lady, but that was denied. So here I was, eight years old, and our life was very, very difficult. And so I told my father, Daddy, I think time has come that we should escape to Romania. The Romanian border was just one hour by foot from our house, and the rumor was that life for Jews in Romania was much better. And it turned out it was correct. Romania refused to let Germany pick up the Jews. They said, we will take care of them in our ghettos here, but you cannot take them away. So all the Jews of Romania survived. 
But my father said to me, you are just a little girl, eight years old. What on earth do you understand about the big issues in life? I have a theory that children between the ages of six and 13 or 12 are a lot smarter than parents give them credit. After, after 13, the hormones set in, and I don't know what happens <laughs> to all these smart, wonderful children. But I can explain it to you why. Children between 6 and 12 function by instinct. They do not rationalize everything that's going around, do not try to figure it out rationally. And I could sense it in every ounce of my being that things were getting very bad. But my father said to me, you're just a little girl. You don't understand it. We have a nice home. We have plenty of food. You children go to school. And then he rationalized, saying, and the Nazis won't come. The Germans won't come to this tiny village to pick up six Jews. Their daddy, I am eternally sorry that you were 100% wrong. And I, the eight-year-old kid, was 100% right. I sure wish it was the other way around. So we were in March of 1944. We were taken to a regional ghetto. Two and a half months later, last week of May, we were herded into cattle cars, traveling for about four days without food, without water. It was very hot on those cattle cars. And we arrived in Auschwitz. Of course, we didn't know where we were being taken. Um, the cattle car doors opened, thousands of people poured out onto a little strip of land called the selection platform. In my opinion, there is no other strip of land like the selection platform measuring 85 feet long by 35 foot wide that witnessed as many millions of people being ripped apart from their families forever. So as we were standing there, my mother grabbed my twin sister and me by the hand. We were her youngest children, and she hoped that as long as she could hold on to us, that somehow she could protect us. Everything was moving very fast. And I, my childish curiosity, I looked around trying to figure out what on earth is this place? Then I realized that my father and two older sisters disappeared in the crowd. Never ever did I see them again. As we were holding on to mother for dear life, a Nazi was running, yelling in German, twins, twins. We did not volunteer any information. He noticed us. Miriam and I looked alike, and we were dressed alike. And he demanded to know from my mother if we were twins. And my mother didn't know what to say. She asked, is that good? And the Nazi nodded, yes. And my mother said, yes. At that moment, we were pulled in one direction. My mother was pulled in the opposite direction. We were crying. She was crying. And that was the last time I saw her. I didn't even understand that that would happen, because I might have done something to run back to my mother and say goodbye. We became part of a group of little girls, all twins. In our group, there were 13 sets of little girls between the ages of 2 and 16, and one mother who had seven-year-old twins. And she was my mother's friend. Her name was Mrs. Changeri. We were taken to a big building for processing which took the whole day basically sitting naked and not knowing what would happen to us. Finally, the processing began. We were given short haircuts. Our um, dresses were returned with a huge red cross on the back, and we were tattooed by heating a needle over the flame of a lamp. When the needle got hot, they dipped it into ink and they burned into my left arm, dot by dot, the capital letter A-7063. Miriam became capital A-7064. Auschwitz was the only Nazi camp that tattooed its inmates. My husband is a survivor of four years in Buchenwald. 
He does not have a tattoo. Once we were processed, we were taken to our barrack. Crude and filthy, modular horse barns. There were no windows. We were given bunk beds on the bottom that were covered with a thin straw mattress. And we finally thought after four days in the cattle car that we could stretch out and maybe sleep. But human beings cannot function after such a traumatic day. So I kept tossing and turning, and as I did, I noticed something big and dark moving on the floor. And I counted them, and when I got to five, I said to myself, these are the biggest mice I have ever seen, and began screaming, mice. A girl from the top bunk with said, silly kids, these are not mice, they are rats. You better get used to them because they are everywhere, and they were. So now I couldn't even try to go back to sleep. I went to the latrine, and as I entered the place, there on the filthy latrine floor were the scattered corpses of three children. I have never, ever seen anybody dead before. But the message to me was clear, that in this place, children were dying. So right then and there, I made a silent pledge that I will do anything and everything within my power to make sure that Miriam and I shall not end up on that filthy latrine floor, that we will somehow survive and walk out of this camp alive. And I even had an image in my mind of how Miriam and I might look when we walked out of this camp alive. We, our daily routine, we would be awakened every morning at 5 a.m. By 6 a.m. we were outside for roll call. And I can tell you that by the time the winter of 1944-45 turned rolled in, my dress was filled with holes and so were my shoes. We did not get any winter clothes. I have no idea how we survived it. Um, just to, for the sake of getting through my lecture faster, I will just give you a description of our experience in the barrack. We were mostly little girls at one time as 200, 300, 400, depending on how many twins were. We were little girls between the age of 2 and 16, huddled in our filthy bunk beds, crawling with lice and rats. We were starved for food. We were starved for human kindness. And we were starved for the love of the mothers and fathers we once had. We had no rights, but we had a fierce determination to live one more day, to survive one more experiment. The experiments were run six days a week, and I was used in two types of experiments. Three days a week, we would be placed naked in a room for up to eight hours, and they would measure just about every part of my body and compare it to my twin sister and compare it to charts. These were not dangerous, but even in Auschwitz, I had difficulty coping with the fact that I was reduced to the lowest form of human existence just a mass of breathing cells. On alternate days, on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, we would be taken to another lab that I call the blood lab. There, they would tie both of my arms to restrict the blood flow, take a lot of blood from my left arm, and give me a minimum of five injections into my right arm. Those were the deadly ones. The rumor was, in Auschwitz, that these contains drugs, diseases, and germs. And that is probably a pretty good assumption. But we do not know up to today what was the content of those injections, nor what was the scope of the experiments. After one of those injections, I became very ill with a very high fever, a fact I desperately tried to hide. My next visit to the blood lab, instead of tying my arms for blood taking and injections, they measured my fever, and I knew I was in trouble. I had a very high fever. 
I was trembling in the August sun. My arms and legs were swollen and very painful, and I had huge red spots throughout my body. The hospital was an other barrack, but filled with people who looked more dead than alive. Next morning, Mengele came in with four other doctors. He never ever examined me, he just looked at my fever chart, and then he declared, laughing sarcastically, saying, too bad, she's so young, she has only two weeks to live. I knew he was right, but I refused to die. So I made a second silent pledge that I will prove Mengele wrong, I will survive and be reunited with my twin sister. For the following two weeks, I have only one clear memory. I remember crawling on the barrack floor because I no longer could walk. And I was crawling to reach the other end of the barrack where there was one faucet with water because this barrack was not even allocated water. People were brought there to die. And as I was crawling, I would fade in and out of consciousness. And I kept telling myself, even in a semi-conscious state of mind, I must survive. I must survive. After two weeks, my fever broke. And I immediately felt a lot stronger and a lot better. It took me another three weeks before my fever chart showed normal. And amazingly, I was released and reunited with my twin sister and the other twins. But Miriam looked very sick, and I could not understand that. In Auschwitz, as I often say, dying was very easy. All around us was death. Surviving was a full-time job. And the way that became dangerous, the dangerous sign was if somebody would, would sit and stare into space aimlessly. That was a sign that they have given up their struggle, because everybody struggled to live one more day. And that is the way Miriam looked. And I was very surprised. And I said, what on earth happened to you in the five weeks that I was in the hospital? She said, I cannot talk about it. I will not talk about it. And Miriam and I never talked about Auschwitz until 1985. The word Auschwitz never came up in our conversation. And in my opinion is that children who struggle for their life, they cannot go back to the experience because they have to feel safe even as grown-ups. And that feeling of safety is very important and it's very difficult to come by if their safety was violated as children. And second thing is that most survivors of atrocities are afraid if they talk about it, they will fall apart. My experience has been that I have only remembered as much as I could cope with. So I said to Miriam, when we talked about it in 1985, I said, do you remember when I was taken to the hospital? She said, yes. I said, what happened to you while I was in the hospital? Because there are no books written about our experiments. She said, well, for the first two weeks, I was kept in isolation, and they were waiting for something to happen. I don't know what that was because they didn't tell me, and I don't know if it happened or it didn't happen. But it was the same two weeks that Mengele said I would die. I told Miriam, I spoiled the experiment. I survived. Would I have died, Miriam would have been rushed to Mengele's lab, killed with an injection to the heart, and the Mengele would have done the comparative autopsies. That information comes to me from the Auschwitz Museum, but they also told me that Mengele used 1,500 sets of twins, 3,000 individuals in the experiment, the estimated number of survivors is 250 individuals. Then I asked her what happened to her after the two weeks were up. She said she was injected with many injections that made her feel very sick. After the war, Miriam was always weaker and sicker than I was. 
She got married in 1958 in Israel, expected her first baby in 1960, and she developed severe kidney infections that did not respond to any antibiotic. Second pregnancy in 63 got worse, and this time the Israeli doctor studied her, and they found out that Miriam's kidneys never grew larger than the size of a 10-year-old child. I begged Miriam not to have any more children. I said, you have two children, that's pretty good. But she had a third one, and after her third child was born, her kidneys were deteriorating, and by 1987, she needed to go on dialysis or have a kidney transplant, but she didn't want to live on dialysis. I had a simple choice. I had two kidneys, one sister, of course, I donated one of my kidneys, and we were a perfect match. At that hospital near Tel Aviv, they have been doing kidney transplants for 10 years, and they had 200 survivors, 2,000 survivors. And um, all of them were given anti-rejection medication. None of them developed cancerous polyps, like Miriam did a year after the transplant. And the doctors told me that I should try to find our files from Auschwitz because there had to be something in her body that was injected in the camp that combined with the anti-rejection medication to create the cancer. We never found our files. Miriam's cancer metastasized, and she died June 6, 1993. I will take you back to the camp because it's important for me to describe to you my state of mind as a 10-year-old in Auschwitz. I thought that the whole world was one big concentration camp, that everybody in the world lived like I lived, in miserable conditions without families starving to death and guarded by guards day and night. Until end of August, there was an airplane that appeared over the skies of Auschwitz. It was flying really low, and I could see the American flag on one of the wings. That gave me hope that somebody was trying to free us. And hope in Auschwitz was in very short supply. The air raids continued and increased, and by November of 1944, it felt like a full pledge battlefield, continuous air raids, artillery, all the experiments stopped, and we, the children, developed a daily slogan that someday soon we will be free and we will go home, except we had no idea how that would happen. In early January, the Nazis told us, everybody out of the barracks, we are taking you deep into Germany to protect you from the fighting. In my childish mind, I didn't like the Nazi guards when they were winning the war. So I really didn't want to be near them when they were losing it, and we decided to stay in the barrack. And I think, as I talked a few months ago, a few years ago to a survivor, I said, why did you go out on the death march? He said, they came in with their guns and pointed at our heads. Well, no one came into our barracks, so I guess I had a guardian angel. Next morning we woke up, opened the barrack doors, all the Nazis were gone. We were on our own, about 8,500 according to the Auschwitz Museum, and then the Nazis came back on January 18, 1945 to march us to Auschwitz and try to eliminate as much of the evidence as they could. What I learned is that they were also killing without any rhyme or reason, because there was a group of us, 200 in the kitchen, mm -hmm. and when we went outside, the machine guns were just killing without any rhyme or reason, and what I remember was the barrel of the gun about three feet from my head, and then I fainted. And when I woke up, I looked around, and I was surrounded by dead bodies. And when I reached out and touched one of the girls next to me, she was ice cold. And this is when I realized that I was still alive. 
They marched us from Birkenau, Auschwitz II, to Auschwitz I in the middle of the night. When we arrived there, the Nazis were not willing to give up, and the Allies were right outside the city limits, so they couldn't take us any further. Heavy fighting was raging for the next nine days. My biggest problem in Auschwitz I was there was nothing to drink. And we were very smart survivors. There was no snow on the ground. We would have melted the snow and boiled the water. So in sheer despair, one day I went to the nearby river. I broke the ice, lowered the container tied to a string. And when I looked up, I saw a little girl with braided hair, dressed in beautiful, clean clothes, and she was carrying a school bag. That was my first realization that there was a world beyond the camp where children looked like children and went to school. A few days later, it was very quiet, eerily quiet. I thought, well, maybe this will be the day we will be free. We didn't know how. It was late in the afternoon of January 27, 1945. A woman ran into the barrack yelling at the top of her voice, we are free, we are free, we are free. It was a wonderful event to hear, but I didn't really know if she knew what she was talking about. Because when I looked down from the second story, I couldn't see anything. I said, does she really know what she's saying? So we went downstairs. It was snowing heavily, and it took me 30 minutes to get my eyes and vision adjusted to the falling snow, and at a distance, I could see lots of people. They were all wrapped in white camouflage raincoats. They were smiling from ear to ear, and the most important thing for me was that they didn't look like the Nazis. So we ran up to them, they gave us chocolate, cookie, and hugs. And this was my first taste of freedom. For me to realize that Miriam and I were alive, that my little promise to myself, that first night in the latrine became a reality. And that was an unbelievable experience. I want to thank you all for listening to me and Today's lecture is 134 this year, which means basically the reason I'm telling you is that I talk a lot. <laughs> and why do I talk so much? Because I have learned some very important lessons in my life that I call them life lessons, and I want to share them with you. Life lesson number one, never ever give up on yourself or on your dreams. If you give up, Nothing will happen. And as I look at many of your young faces, I realize, I remember, growing up is very hard. And it's very hard even if you live in the United States and even if you have loving parents. And what a thought that is, that every child in the world would be born to loving parents. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And even if your loving parents have enough money to buy you jeans with holes in them, I don't know why that is so important, but I know it's more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and even if they can buy you all the modern gadgets, even then, every single one of you wonders, how on earth do I fit into this big, big mixed up world? Will I be able to accomplish in life what I set out to do? And I can tell you that if you keep hammering away at it, your wonderful minds, and you have lots of wonderful minds working here at Google, will give you an answer. I had no idea how to survive Auschwitz. And here I am, 70 years later, very happy that I'm alive. Life lesson number two deals with prejudice. One of the reasons that Adolf Hitler and the Nazis rose to power, it was a bad economy. And once Hitler convinced his fellow Germans to vote for him, and he had only one third of the vote, but somehow he became chancellor of Germany. 
Instead of taking care of the economic problems, he decided it would be a lot faster to blame it on somebody, and Jews were always a good group of people to blame it on. And many of the Germans accepted the fact because for centuries, generations, Jews were always used as the scapegoats for all the problems in the world. And they are used again. Just yesterday, I got on Twitter a piece of information that Angela Merkel asked many Jews in Germany as Rosh Hashanah and the High Holy Days are approaching, not to go to the synagogue because they might be firebombed and they cannot protect them all. So in 70 years, I don't see how much has changed. And in many countries in Europe, that is a problem. Prejudice, I call prejudice the cancer of the human soul. It destroys the people who practice it, and it destroys everything in its sight. But that's what Hitler used. And prejudice, as we look around in the world today, is rampant. Now, I will tell you, I will confess to the fact that I am prejudiced, but not against any race, religion, or ethnic group. I basically don't like the torn, the jeans with the holes in them. <laughs> And I don't like the sloppy appearances of people. And I know that here at Google Land or other um, Reddit or wherever we visited yesterday, Facebook and, and uh, tweet, everybody is dressing very casually, very casually. I am a much more formal person. And uh, I feel comfortable wearing a jacket because I don't want anybody to see all my bulges. <laughs> if, I, if I had a gorgeous body, maybe I would not wear the, the jacket. But what I am really concerned about is for, high, for schools, children from age 6 to 18, and even little 11-year-old girls want to look sexy because, of course, they learn from the movie stars and from the uh, movies and the media that that is a way to look. And they flaunt little, their little bodies with low-cut blouses. And they flaunt what they have, what they wish they had. I don't know. So I don't like that. I think that students in school should look like students in school and concentrate on improving their minds. They have enough time to look sexy and sloppy. I, I, I will tell you one thing. When I dress up, but used to be younger, went swimming in a bathing suit. I acted a little bit less formal than I act in my suit. So the way we dress does have an effect on the way we behave. That's my opinion. So I think when I talk to teachers and see some of the little girls with shorts, that their tush is sticking out from it, I said, is that appropriate for your, your dress code? They said, not exactly, but it's too much work to, to check it all out and control it. And about, um, I don't like guys with ponytails, and I'm sure there are many here, <laughs> body piercings, tattoos, and any of that. I, I don't know why it's so important to make holes in your body, and you don't really need them. I don't know. Anyway, obviously, I have none, even the traditional holes that women have, I don't have. I just, no, I don't like to, and tattoos. I, I didn't know that that much ink in the body make you healthier, I don't know. But that is what the style and the tradition is now. Or the, people use it a lot. So, about uh, 16 years ago, I was invited to lecture at a local high school, and I'm heading to the auditorium, and in front of me are three young 16-year-old boys with baggy pants. Now, there is a style of clothing that makes no sense. <laughs> if they had to run for their life, do you think they could? <laughs> they would have to pull those pants up or take them up, one of the two. <laughs> so they were walking in front of me. The crutch was the height of the knee. They were holding the pant up with a hand. And the bottoms were cleaning the hallway as I was walking behind them. When one of them 
accidentally dropped a book, and then he had the audacity to bend down and pick it up. I can tell you, I saw places where the sun never shined. I was so embarrassed, I had to turn away. Then I got mad, because this school was in my tax district, was supported by my tax money. So I went up to the teacher who invited me and told him what happened, and I said to him, these three boys looked like bums. Because people with baggy pants don't look very sharp, in my opinion. And why would anybody want to look like a bum? They probably are, are uh, on drugs or drug addicts. And he told me immediately that these three young boys are very good students and they have never used any drugs. I was shocked. <laughs> But I realize that even I have to take the time and get to know the person and judge each person on their merit. So in the last 16 years, I haven't changed my mind about liking these styles of clothing, but I have made an effort not to jump to any conclusion without getting to know the person. Life lesson number three. I forgave the Nazis, I forgave everybody. And if anybody would have asked me 22 years ago today if I forgave the Nazis, I would have told you, please find a really good psychiatrist. I had no intention of forgiving anybody. I was angry with the world and I hated everybody. And I can tell you, people have difficulty today to really believe that. But I have written a poem um, in 1985, 10 years before I forgave the Nazis. And when you see that poem, it, it's a child's ABC from Auschwitz. A is for Auschwitz, a place close to hell. B is for Birkenau, where brave children dwell. C is for children standing Zeilapel. D is for dead people, bodies everywhere is for experiments, you, you get the, it's a poor me, the poor victim, all the things that was done to me, and there was nothing that I could do. Uh, so when people read that poem, they realize that I have come a long way. And nothing really happened to me until my sister died, and I was uh, asked uh, to a few, about a month after her death, unrelated to her death, I received a telephone call from a professor at Boston College who said to me, Eva Kaur, I have heard your um, presentation at, at uh, Boston Sc School of Medicine. I am doing one of those conferences, and I would like you to come to Boston and lecture to some doctors. And he said, by the way, when you come to Boston, it would be really nice if you could bring with you a Nazi doctor. Stunned at the request, I immediately blurted out, where on earth do you think I can find one of those guys? <laughs> they are not advertising in the yellow pages. <laughs> they are not advertising in Google either. <laughs> so he told me, think about it, maybe you come up with some kind of an ID. And I did. I remember that the last project that Miriam and I worked on was a documentary on the Mengele twins done by German television, finished in March of 1992, and there was a Nazi doctor from Auschwitz in that documentary who was not my doctor, but he was a friend of Mengele's. So I immediately contacted, in Frankfurt, Germany, the television network, CDF, and told them Miriam died would they please give me Dr. Munch's telephone number in the memory of Miriam, and they did. We contacted Dr. Munch, invited him to Boston. He said, no, I'm not coming to Boston, but I'm willing to meet with you, Eva, at my house. So August of 1993, I am heading to Germany to meet a Nazi doctor. I was so scared, but I remembered about Nazi doctors. I did not want to experience again. But I was curious, maybe he knew something about our experiment. And I was curious, why was this Nazi doctor willing to meet with me? 
I arrived at his house. He treated me with the utmost respect, kindness, consideration, telling me he didn't know anything about our experiments because Mengele always said the twins' experiments are top secret. He gave me a good interview for my Boston conference. And then out of the blues, I never planned to ask him anything. I heard myself say, Dr. Munch, by any chance, do you know anything about the operation of the gas chambers in Auschwitz? And he immediately blurted out, this is my problem. This is a nightmare that I live with every single day of my life. And he went on describing the operation of the gas chamber. People would be told that they are going to take a shower after the long journey. The shower rooms were cleaned, polished, and they would even spread perfume in the rooms. Once the shower room was packed with people, the doors would close hermetically. Dr. Munch was stationed outside looking through a peephole. And he said that the gas did not come from the shower heads. They came, Zyklon B looks like pellets of white gravel. They were packed in canisters. The canisters were opened outside the roof and dropped to vent like openings in the roof. So they came from the roof, fell to the floor, operated like dry ice. So the gas was actually rising from the floor. And as people were suffocating, often taking their last breath of air, they would try to climb on other people to get away from the rising gas, forming a little mountain of intermingled bodies. Dr. Munch knew that the strongest people were on the top of the pile. And when the strongest people stopped moving, he knew that everybody was dead and he would sign one death certificate. Of course, no names, just the number of people that were murdered. I told him immediately that this was very important information. I have never heard about it before, never read it in any book, never seen it in any documentary, and that I was going to Auschwitz in 1995. I wanted him to go with me and sign a document at the ruins of the gas chambers in the company of witnesses. So if years later, people could not say that he didn't sign it. And he immediately told me that he would love to. I did not know it was going to be that easy, but I got back to Terre Haute, Indiana, and I was very excited that I will have actually a Nazi who witnessed it testify to the operation of the gas chamber. I wanted to thank him. I didn't know how to thank a Nazi doctor. I didn't even know where does one look for a gift for a Nazi doctor. So I went to the local Hallmark shop and went to the section of thank you cards. I started reading card after card for two and a half hours. And I was very serious. Two ladies came up to me telling me, you know, you've been reading those cards for a long time. I said, yes. Are you finding what you are looking for? Not really. Well, what are you looking for? Tell us, maybe we can help you. I said, no, thank you. I left the card shop. But of course, I couldn't give up my idea. And I went back to my own life lesson number one. For the next 10 months, while I was cooking, cleaning, doing the laundry, or driving the car for my real estate functions, when my mind wasn't too busy, I kept asking myself and brainstorming, what can I give this Nazi doctor? How can I thank him? And lots of ideas popped into my head. None of them seemed appropriate until 10 months later. But a simple idea, how about a letter of forgiveness from me to Dr. Munch? I immediately knew that this was a meaningful gift for Dr. Munch. But what I discovered for myself was life changing. I discovered that I had the power to forgive. No one could give me that power. No one could take it away. It was all mine to use it in any way I wished. So I began writing my letter. It took me another four months, and finally I liked what I wrote. 
But then it occurred to me that somebody might read my letter and my spelling in English is terrible. So I contacted my former English professor to correct my spelling, and she got very enthusiastic. We met three times, and the third day, the third time we met, she said, well, Eva, that's nice that you forgive Dr. Munch, but your problem is with Dr. Mengele, not with Munch. I tried to debate that. She said, just do me a favor, she said. When you go home to, tonight, pretend that you are talking to Mengele and telling him that you forgive him because what I want you to find out for yourself, how does it make you feel to be able to do that? It sounded like a good idea. And that day I went home, I closed the bedroom door, I looked up as many nasty words in the dictionary. Now I would use Google. They didn't have Google then, um, as I could find, and wrote them down. I read them out clear and loud. And then at the end I said, in spite of all that, I forgive you. That felt very interesting, that I, the little guinea pig from Auschwitz, had the power even over Mengele. And my relationship with Mengele would end with my letter of forgiveness. There was nothing that he could do to change it. I wasn't hurting anybody, so why couldn't I do it? And if I forgave Mengele, the worst of them, I decided to forgive everybody who has ever hurt me. And that is the way we arrived in Auschwitz. Dr. Munch came with his family. I took my family, Dr. Munch, signed his document, I read mine and signed it, and gave the copies that I had there to Dr. Munch. I immediately felt that all the pain I carried around for 50 years was lifted from my shoulder. I was no longer a victim of Auschwitz, nor was I a prisoner of my tragic past. I was free of Auschwitz and free of Mengele. I believe, from my understanding and research, that anger is a seed for war. Happy children do not grow up to be mass murderers. But angry children might like to have a revenge. And Hitler himself was a very angry man and felt like a victim, and so he I call therefore anger is a seed for war. On the other hand, people who forgive are at peace with themselves and the world. So I call forgiveness a seed for peace. If any of you in this wonderful group of Google people is angry, all you will really need is a piece of paper and a pen and start writing a letter to the person or persons who hurt you. At the end, you must write the words, I forgive you, and you must mean them. And if it's not going to make you, I believe you will feel liberated, elated. I would describe the experience like Maria on the, in the sound of music being at the top of the hill and fresh air breathing all around her. And if it works for you, I hope you pass it on to other people who need it, because I need everybody to help me sow those seeds for peace. Congratulations. You survived my lecture. <laughs> now I'm ready for your questions and answers and pictures and then you can Google everybody, everything you want to. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you for your lecture. You mentioned having been raised in, uh, in an Orthodox household. Did you maintain a religious identity and religious practice well, through um, adulthood? I am Jewish. I paid too much price for it to become any other religion, and uh, I am not a very religious person today. And the reason that is, 
that I know some people have challenged me. How can you not be religious? And I will tell you an interesting observation that you, none of you, even if you plan it, will know how you will cope when your life is on the line. I arrived in Auschwitz the first night. I didn't eat the bread because it was not kosher. Even though we were in the cattle car for four days without any food. When I saw the dead children in the latrine, in, as at age 10, I could not figure out what to do. I decided that I was going to live. And for that, it meant that I had to do eat everything and do everything to survive. That is the way I coped with life and death. So I discarded that little religious girl, and instead of being a little religious Jewish girl, I became a survivor. I never went back to the religion, but that doesn't mean that every person coped the way I coped. I have met twins who survived, who said they survived because they were praying. That was not what happened to me. And if anybody thinks among you that you know how you will cope when life and death issues, when you're facing life and death, I'm telling you, you're very naive. So when you were in Auschwitz, um, like you said before, I mean, death was all around you. What made, what was so different about your experience? Uh, do you think it really was your strong desire to live? Was there sort of... Well, there, I, I, there was, how come that I didn't give up? <coughs> that has to do with my early childhood. I had, we had two older sisters, and my parent, my mother was expecting, and my father desperately wanted a boy. So when he died, well, he was worried about somebody saying the prayer of the dead. Kaddish for him. Well, the midwife told my father that there was a little girl, but he said, don't despair, another one is coming. Of course, his hope was that this was going to be a boy. So I arrived as the greatest disappointment to my father. <laughs> and when I was five and a half years old, one day he said to me, Eva, I said, yes, daddy, he said, you should have been a boy. I knew nothing about reproduction. <laughs> I saw the storks molt the babies. I said that I don't think it's my fault. And he got very mad at me. So from that time on, I was set up to failure just about every day. And I remember he would find some excuse to punish me. And I remember talking to Miriam, comparing notes about daddy after the war, and Miriam said, daddy was a wonderful guy. He would put me on his lap and tell me stories about his visit to Palestine. I said, Miriam, I, did we have the same father? <laughs> I saw his lap when he pulled out his belt to belt me. These were our two different experiences. I learned in those four and a half years to defy my father and outsmart him. So when I arrived in Auschwitz, I already had four and a half years of experience of outsmarting authority. Of course, the authority in Auschwitz was bigger and more dangerous, but I was not as scared. Miriam always looked at me what I was doing, like I really knew what I was doing, but I did not let fear rule, my, rule and ruin my life. And that is the way I became so different from the others. Thank you. Um, and my second question is, um, when you were talking about your process for forgiving um, the doctors, mm -hmm. how you would write a letter to them and then at the end write, I forgive you. And, um, but, and you said the key is that you have to mean it. So there are people that I would like to forgive in my life. Um, Do not mail it to them. No, no. <laughs> I because I had a bad experience with a friend who wrote a guy who molested her, mm -hmm. and then he wrote back to her 
He said, well, I have to forgive you too because I spent five years in jail. And that be, that's a toxic relationship. And I don't think that you can really repair it because they live with their own venomous life. I, I don't know. However, I think that if you can forgive, truly forgive, like I have forgiven the Nazis, you open up a lot of other experiences to enter in your life instead of cluttering your life mm -hmm. with pain and anger. Mm -hmm. And that is a reason that I feel it's so important for people to forgive. I also talked yesterday and other times to lawyers and the judicial system talks about justice. Well, what on earth is justice? <laughs> When I ask very well-educated people, they have difficulties in defining it. And I don't think that justice really exists, but the judicial system is trying to accomplish that. At the same time, if every Nazi would have been hanged after World War II, I, the victim, would have still been an 11-year-old orphan who was used in experiments and survived unbelievable things. So how on earth would it help me? If the judicial system would pay as much attention in healing the victims as they pay in punishing the perpetrators, the judicial system would work very well. Because in my humble opinion, Every unhealed victim is a potential perpetrator. Look at the prisons are filled with people who were not born to be criminals, but something happened in their lives, and they are lashing out at society at whoever they can. I want to thank you so much for speaking to us um, about your experiences and what you've learned. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell the story of how you started to speak to groups like this and how that has evolved over time. That is a very interesting thing. I, first of all, I used to be scared. I was a member of a Jewish women's organization and they made me vice president of one branch. And I remember getting ready for those reports. My stomach was in nuts and I could hardly hear my voice. But after two, three years of that, I became president of that organization, and I voiced my opinion clearly. Now, I did not speak about my experiences until 1978. I never made a secret out of it. I never covered my number, and if people ask about where did this number come from, I would tell them. And I have a cute little story about that. So you would understand how children's minds work. My daughter, whose name is, oh, I cannot give out her name. She doesn't like to be famous. <laughs> she lives in San Francisco. But she was three years old, and she had a little friend, Jill. And uh, she went for a slumber party with her friend, Jill. And my Mrs. Baker, Jill's mother, fixed breakfast. My daughter said, Mrs. Baker, where is your number? <laughs> she said, what number? She said, well, my mommy has a number. <laughs> I thought all mommies have numbers. <laughs> so that is the way children understand the world. So Mrs. Baker said to my daughter, no, not all mothers have numbers. So why does my mommy have a number? She said, you better go home and ask her. So she came home skipping and hopping. She said, Mommy, you know Mrs. Baker doesn't have a number. I said, I know that. Well, how come you do? I said, well, you know those bad guys, Nazis, killed your grandparents? They also put a number on my arm. Oh. And she wanted a simple answer. I gave her the answer, and she was happy with it. But children always feel whatever happens to them, that is the way the world is. So I didn't lecture. The Holocaust show was shown in the United States in 1978. 
I was contacted by Jewish organizations in New York to uh, make sure that our local affiliate will carry the documentary, the docudrama. I didn't know what a docudrama was. And so I contacted the local NBC station and I told them that I was wondering in that docudrama if they had documentary footage. And they asked me why. I said, because I want to know if I can recognize it. What do you mean? You were there? I said, well, what do you think this accent is? <laughs> and I said, yes. They said, uh, no, it's based on the actual documentary footage, but it's not a documentary footage. It will look similar. So I appeared, but because they realized that I was a the survivor, they asked me to appear on the nightly news the first night that the show aired, and they got such a strong response, they wanted me back the last night. And local junior high school students, first was a junior high school student, contacted me and said, would I be willing to lecture at his school? I said, sure. I didn't know exactly what I was going to say. And I think I talked for three hours. The school was shut down. but. And then other schools asked me, and civic groups asked me. And after maybe 10 or 15 lectures, I realized that everybody was interested in how I survived. So then I decided to write down, because the mind has an interesting thing. You start talking about a topic, and it's like branches of a tree. Grow, keep other memories, keep running into it. So you have to focus on what, what I needed to say. And so I designed my lecture. I wrote it out. Um, and I wrote it out how I survived Auschwitz. And I started to add lessons much, much later. But an interesting thing. I was always very cool, calm, and collected. I never had any emotion. And I was very proud of it. But from 1978 until 1985, I finished every lecture with a very strange statement. I said, I know it happened to me, but I always feel like I'm looking down at that little girl and telling her story. And nobody said, that's a strange statement. Why are you saying it? They think that survivors are very fragile. I am not. Anyway. In 1985, I was lecturing at a local university, Indiana State University, and it was September of 1985. And I described the separation from my mother. And I began sobbing uncontrollably. I did not have a hanky in my pocket because I never needed one. I'm sure I have one now. And. I was wiping my nose. It was embarrassing. It was terrible. And every lecture after that, similar experiences I had, until maybe 15 lectures later, I realized that something changed in my relationship to my story. And I realized that never again did I say at the end of my lecture, that I'm standing up here looking down at that little girl and telling her story. Because that little girl and me became one. And I could feel all the horrors that I have experienced in the camp. My lectures have evolved tremendously. And some people have heard my lectures 25 years ago because I've been lecturing now 37 years. And they say they liked it then, but they like it more now. So I don't know. But, uh, and I don't have any recorded lectures from those early times. As time goes by, just unfortunately, we ha will have fewer opportunities to hear from people such as yourself who experienced all of this firsthand. And documentaries and letters and so on are, are helpful, or recordings of lectures are helpful. But there's something to be said for 
hearing from someone Well, themselves. I, I decided I was going to live forever. <laughs> <laughs> But, but my question is, how, how can, what is the best way in which we can allow these stories and these lives to live on um, 50 years from now, 100 years from now? Well, I have visited the Shoah Foundation in Southern California University with uh, um, Stephen Smith. And um, they are willing to produce a hologram of my life. We are trying to raise the money for it because it's not any kind of money that I have. Uh, and I have witnessed, I have interacted with the hologram they have created of Pinkus. So I don't know if that is going to be the answer to your particular question. Uh, would you like to say anything, Kiel, regarding that? Hey everyone, my name's Kiel, so I'm the director of Eva's museum, uh, but basically I'm just a guy. I'm not Jewish, I'm, I'm just a regular guy who thought this lady's story is powerful and needs to be preserved and shared widely, both now and in the future. And I want to take your question and turn it back on you guys, because this is Google. And if something can be done that's crazy and futuristic anywhere in the world, it's right here on this campus. Uh, so. Maybe people don't have answers or ideas right now, but let that germinate. How can we take this lady's story and elevate her platform both now and for generations to come? Boy, that's a big assignment. <laughs> <laughs> you thought I was tough. Look at that. I wanted to know, I've read in accounts from other survivors that, that Mengele at times gave uh, treats to the children or treated them almost as mm -hmm. described as like a kindly father. I want to know, is that really true in your experience? In um, your I have heard from twins who have received candy from Mangala. You have to understand that the relationship between us and Mangala was one of the most complicated human relationship. We knew within the first month that he probably was responsible for the death of our families. Yet, he was willing to do, as long as he wanted us alive, he was willing to do anything to keep us alive. And in the eyes of many of the children, he replaced the father that they no longer had. And so therefore, I was not a very, I was a very angry child when I arrived in Auschwitz. And I am sure that my instincts and my vibrations, Mangala got that I didn't want to have anything to do with him. So he never gave me any candy, nor I don't think that I would have taken it. I don't know. Because we were starving to death, but I definitely was not one of those that Mangala would treat like his little sweet little children. I was angry. And I don't really know how people, but I know that if I enter into a room, I can sense it if this is a friendly group or a dangerous group, and I head out even though without knowing anything. So I am sure that being ever close to me, he did not get any good vibrations, and I was a tough cookie. Yeah. But I heard about it, and I believe it definitely happened. Thank you very much for this little, the little team who kind of brought us all out here. It has been an honor for me to spend an hour in your presence, and I think I probably speak on behalf of everyone here. Um, so thank you. And then I'll message you about the book. Thank you very much.